Welcome to the second edition of the Berkeley Haas Speaker Series, New Thinking in a Pandemic, Business, Economics, and Inclusion. I'm Don Moore, Lorraine Tyson Mitchell, Professor of Leadership and Communication at Berkeley Haas. I'm thrilled today to be joined by Annie Duke, decision, decision strategist and uh, former professional poker champion. She's the author of the national bestseller, Thinking in Bets, Making Smarter Decisions When You Don't Have All the Facts, and the forthcoming book, How to Decide, Simple Tools for Making Better Choices. Annie won more than $4 million in tournament poker before she retired from the game in 2012. She is also the co-founder of the Alliance for Decision Education, a nonprofit whose mission is to improve lives by improve, empowering students through decision skills education. Thank you so much for joining me today, Annie. Thanks for having me. So um, I have lots of questions for you uh, <laughs> okay. arising from uh, what you've written and its connection to current events and my own fascination with decision making. Um, recently, you tweeted about the parallels you saw between the advice to wear masks in this pandemic and the advice from Ignaz Semmelweis 200 years ago that doctors should wash their hands between patients. Can you explain that connection? Oh, yeah. So that's a great question. Um, wasn't expecting that. Yay. Um, no, those are my favorite kinds. Yeah. So actually, uh, chapter, the last chapter of my new book, How to Decide, opens with uh, the Semmelweis story. Um, and so for people who aren't um, familiar with it, he was working um, in a hospital in the 1800s, early 1800s. And um, this was a time when women were dying of childbed fever. So they would have a baby, they would get an infection. Obviously uh, at the time there were no antibiotics and they would die from that. So what happened was that a colleague of his, I think it was actually a senior, a senior doctor um, ha had been working with an autopsy. So he had a patient that was, had died and he was doing an autopsy on the body. And during the autopsy, he had sliced his finger and he died of childbed fever. So what Semmelweis uh, posited was that childbed fever was actually caused by, by some sort of thing that had to do with, at the time, germs, right? That's what he was saying about it. Although this was you know, before people really understood that these little microbes could get you. So he figured, okay, he had sliced his finger. Obviously there was some sort of infection that had gotten in through the finger from touching the dead body so that Basically, the idea was maybe doctors shouldn't go from touching one patient or, or particularly dead bodies right to um, delivering babies where there's obviously a lot of ways for infection to get in there. So he instituted a policy of washing hands um, and everybody was supposed to wash their hands in between patients. Um, and it worked amazingly, actually. Uh, I think that the incidents, I, I think there was something like 16% of mothers were dying from childbed fever and it went down to like 2% or something like don't take that as for sure it's in my book I'm it's not I don't have it off the top of my head um but this is where the story gets really interesting so you would think okay that's it yay <laughs> solve that problem uh, but no um the doctors got very upset about this when when the hand washing turned out to work because what they felt was that this was um essentially the implication was that doctors hands were dirty and doctors were not dirty people, they were gentlemen. Um, and so they rejected the evidence right before their eyes and in fact uh, fired um, him. He went to a couple other postings where he instituted the same policies, got the same result, but the same thing, ended up having it be rejected uh, and ultimately died in an insane asylum, uh, kind, you, know, you know, just sort of like ironically from an infection, that's how he died. So um, that's, I open this because what I'm really talking about is that it, beliefs have this very kind of uh, in, infectious quality. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of number one. So I'm sort of saying like, you don't wanna be spreading childbed fever and you, you can be doing this through the way that you're expressing your beliefs. The way that uh, the other piece of the story, of course, is that there's a tremendous amount of motivated reasoning happening in here, right? That um, we think that presented with evidence, human beings are rational. And obviously, oh, look, it went down from 16% to 2%. Who's going to reject that evidence that's right before their eyes? But when it has to do with um, kind of protecting your identity, in this case of the doctors, we're clean, dirty, we're clean people who are gentlemen, 
you will actually get into a lot of sort of twisted knots in order to defend that. And the ultimate result is that he got fired. So I was just thinking that we, you know, that seems like a lot of what's kind of going on with masks. Uh huh. Um, yeah. yeah. Right on. Uh, let's let's hope that Anthony Fauci ends uh, uh, better than than Ignaz Semmelweis. <laughs> yeah. I, well, hopefully so. My 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 daughter actually pointed out something that I thought was very insightful, was that uh, the same people who are saying that the the mask uh, allows uh, basically air to come in. Um, not thinking about respiratory droplets, obviously, but air to come in so that the so that um, co the COVID microbes can can actually get in there. Are also saying that they're going to be suffocated and have CO two poisoning because <laughs> the air can't get out. So I guess that it can get it can get in but not out. I'm not exactly sure how that works. But anyway, she pointed out that there was there was a little disconnect there, which is similar. The logic might not be perfect. Yeah, might not um, possibly. So, Everybody wear a mask, please. That's it. <laughs> please. please. For please. all of our sakes. Please. please. Otherwise, I will end up <laughs> dying of an infection <laughs> in an asylum. Um, the, in, in your new book, which uh, I love, uh, you, you um, advocate uh, passionately and persuasively for the value of thinking probabilistically. Can you talk about its role in a pandemic given the uncertainties that so many of us face, including with mask wearing, that it doesn't pr protect you 100%. Um, yeah, oh yeah, there's a, there, so a lot to unpack, a lot of different ways to go. So let me just kind of start here, which is we can, we can think about the environments with, in which we make decisions as kind of like, let's say over here would be perfect knowledge, perfect certainty. And over here would be, uh, you know, no certainty whatsoever. Like we, we're literally blind to, to what's going on in the world. So if we think about that, basically with coronavirus, I think that it's very obvious that we're sort of over at this side, right? That there's tons and tons of uncertainty. The information uh, landscape is shifting very rapidly. Uh, there's obviously a lot of luck involved. We know there's a lot of luck uh, just in terms of who do you run into in the world, right? So there's a lot of luck in whether you get it or not. Are you going to be asymptomatic or not? There's a lot of luck in that. Uh, do we? When do we get a vaccine? If and when? Who discovers it? You know, all of that stuff. There's obviously quite a bit of luck influencing that. What I think is interesting is that uh, while people acknowledge, I think, because the uncertainty is kind of slapping you in the face right now, that we're, there's a lot of uncertainty right now. What I keep hearing from people is, but when things go back to normal and it's stable, that kind of thinking won't apply, right? Uh, and what I try to get across to people is that for most of the decisions you're making, where you're making these subjective judgments because you do have imperfect information, we have the illusion maybe that the environment right now with COVID is kind of over here and our normal environment is sitting over here in terms of certainty, but it's actually butting up right against it. It's just that it's just far enough away that we can fool ourselves into thinking it's over here. So the main reason why it's really good to think probabilistically is because the world is probabilistic. I mean, it, it's really that simple. It's the closer you get to being able to represent the world as it is, the better your decision-making is gonna be. And you know, from your work in terms of overconfidence, um, you know, we might think that we have the ability to predict the future and, and know with something close to 100% certainty that, that the future will unfold in a certain way. COVID is kind of like disillusioned us from that, but even you can hear people talking about when it goes away, then, then I'll still be able to predict things with 100% certainty, you know? So, so I just really believe the world is, is probabilistic in nature. Outcomes are probabilistic. Um, and that's kind of how you have to be thinking about the world in order to be a good decision maker because it's just how the world is. I had to think a lot about probabilities when I was thinking about writing my book. I talked to a decision researcher named Chip Heath, who's also mm -hmm. a successful author. And his advice to me was, um, I cannot in good conscience recommend that you write a book. It is such an uncertain, uh, it's, you're buying a lottery ticket and there's so many other things you could do with your time. Um, can you tell me about how, about how you chose to write, how to decide? Um, 
Well, yeah. So I actually have to take it back a little further. Like if I take it back to say thinking of bats. Mm -hmm. um, and what I would say is that I actually thought that through, right? I, you, there's a very wide range of how a book might do. Uh, and despite a lot of survivorship bias uh, of people who think that, well, obviously I wrote an amazing book and that's why it did well. There's lots of amazing books that don't do so well uh, because a lot of it just kind of depends like, uh, what does the world look like uh, in terms of when you're releasing the book into the world uh, and that you can't really control because you start the process of writing the book a couple of years, generally, at least, depending on how many deadlines you miss, um, a couple of years prior to prior to actually deciding to write it. So you don't, you what environment, what, what other things are coming out at the same time that you might not be aware of. And then there's just a lot of stuff of like, do people respond to it? Um, uh, who happens to read it? Do you get lucky and have somebody who has a really big platform have that book end up in their hands? And some of that you can obviously execute through skill, but a lot of that just has to do with luck. Um, so I had, I thought about that at the time that I went to go write Thinking in Bats. And my, my advice to people from that experience and how I thought about it at the time was if you're going to write a book, write a book because you want to because you want to learn, because you want to work through your own thoughts, because you want to figure out what it is that you actually think about the world, because there's no better way to do that than actually having to write it in a way that another human being could understand it, which is no small feat. I think that we, we tend to walk around in the world with these thoughts going through our heads and think that they're totally clear. But when you try to put those things down on a piece of paper, it, it really exposes your own thinking to yourself in a way that you're seeing it a little bit more from the outside. Uh, I know that there were things that I really changed my mind about, not necessarily 180 degree reversals, but even like a 10%, you know, reversal is really, really good for, for me. Um, uh, so I did it as I, I feel like I have something I want to say, and I kind of really want to work through these ideas. And so I'm going to be satisfied if, three people write this book. And that's the way that I thought about it. And then if people like it, people like it. And wouldn't that be exciting? Um, and I feel that I got really, really lucky because people liked it. Um, and I had a couple- More than three of, people read it too. <laughs> definitely more than three people have read it. Uh, and it seems to have be a pretty long tailed book, which is kind of fun. Um, but I can tell you, like I had a few really lucky things happen in there. Like Mark Andreessen, who's quite a famous investor. I didn't know him. I'd never met him. And it just turned out that somehow my book ended up in his hands and then he liked it. And then he told people about it. If that doesn't happen, I think that my book has a really different trajectory. And there were, there were a few other things like that, that happened where I was not purposely trying to get the book to somebody. It turns out that somebody read it and they kind of liked it. And then, um, and then that, that went out in the world and it does that those paths didn't have to occur. Um, and it's sort of a collision there of luck and skill. I have to write a book that resonates, right? That's sort of the skill portion, but then the other stuff I didn't have control over. The reason why I wrote How to Decide, because after I wrote Thinking and Best, I swore I was done and I was never writing another book. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. um, uh, Cause while it's an amazing thing to work through your own ideas, it's also absolute torture um, because <laughs> you realize that you have no idea what you're talking about and all the things that you thought you knew, you don't actually know. And why are you even doing this? Um, but I wrote how to decide because the way that I kind of think about um, thinking in bats is that it's, it's a meditation and, and a, I sort of feel like it's a love letter. That's the way that I think about it to uncertainty and to why you shouldn't be afraid of it. And it's kind of really beautiful. Um, and if you can really kind of live in it, that your life is better, you're less anxious, your decision making definitely improves. Uh, and then it's kind of what makes life amazing. Um, and that's kind of how I think about that book. Um, so it's this kind of big idea, right? About this amazing thing that exists and we all sort of run away from, but maybe we should be running toward it more because it's really cool. So Amen. what happened was as I was going out and kind of talking about this book to people, I would say that the most common question I got was, so that's awesome, but how, how do I, how do I actually execute on this stuff? Like I, I, I get it. I read it. I'm all in. 
I believe we should be embracing uncertainty and we should be wrapping that into the way that we're making decisions. And we should be thinking about systems that help to de-bias us. Because one of the things that I talk about is that the uncertainty is what allows bias to kind of get into the cracks. And they say, we agree. That's, yes, you convinced us, but how? Um, and that's where I get to how to decide because I said, well, oh gosh, maybe I need to write this other book about how. And so that's what I did. Nice. It, um, I, I just want to flag a, a specific feature of the answer you just gave and honor you for uh, honestly confessing the um, counterfactuals in the history of your success. Thinking it that's was a huge success, but you know ways in which that could have turned out otherwise. And that, I wanna connect that to an idea um, on which how to decide is so articulate. And that is the dangers of resulting, what poker players call resulting. Can you tell us uh, how poker players use that term and how it impairs our ability to learn from experience? Yeah, absolutely. So th this is actually the, a, a term that doesn't, that doesn't appear in thinking in bets, but that uh, in terms of cl uh, clarifying, um, I adopted for how to decide, which is the paradox of experience. And essentially the idea behind the paradox of experience is that uh, we can agree that experience is necessary for learning. Um, Skinner knew that, right? <laughs> Pavlov, all those <laughs> way back when we knew that. Experience is necessary for learning, but uh, any individual experience that you might have can actually very much interfere with learning. So let's think about why that is. Um, and it has to do with um, uncertainty, the uncertainty that exists in the relationship between decision quality and outcome quality. So uh, in some things that we do, decision quality and outcome quality are correlated at nearly one. If we were to think about a game that's like that, chess would be more in that spectrum. Not all the way, but mostly there. So if I'm a worse decision maker in a game of chess with you, I will should lose basically 100% of the time. Um, so I know that if I lose, I can look at that result, right? That outcome, that experience that I've had, that I've lost, and I can work backwards pretty neatly to what the quality of my decision making was relative to yours. And I can know, well, I must've made worse decisions than Don. And so now I can use that as feedback in order to learn. But most human activities, most decisions that we make, um, most think, most environments in which we are making our decisions and, and making our choices are not chess-like. They're much more poker-like. And so if we think about poker, uh, if I lose a hand of poker, I'm not exactly sure what that means about my decision-making in comparison to you because I can make a perfectly good decision and because of a, a turn of a bad card, um, I can certainly lose. Um, I can make terrible, horrible, awful decisions and um, still win, although that certainly never happened to me. That only happened to me. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's not true. I did that a lot. Um, you know, and then we sort of add in this problem of hidden information, right? So in chess, the position is, you can see the whole position. So I don't need to guess at what your possible moves are. If I, if I make a move, I know what your position is and what, what the set of possible responses are. In poker, of course, I don't know what your hand is. So we've got this kind of mushing up of all of this stuff. Um, and what that means is that in the short run, and this is kind of the paradox of experience, right? Because when I say any individual experience, I'm talking about a short run problem. In the short run, the results of my playing poker don't actually give me a really good signal of whether my decisions were good or not. It's a noisy signal contaminated by chance. It's incredibly noisy, very contaminated by chance. So, um, so this now creates this resulting problem, which is that human beings' minds don't like to that situation. Um, Michael Mobison talks a lot about the interpreter, the, the part of our brain that immediately, as soon as you get a result, tries to find a cause. Um, and we can think about that kind of interfering that uh, you immediately want to sort of connect the dots. This is also related to conspiracy, why people believe conspiracy theories, but we like these things to be causal. Um, and so there's a couple of different ways that we handle it, one of the, which is resulting that if I'm looking at somebody's results who I'm not in some sort of competition with, say, say the way I open how to decide, uh, rather thinking in bets is with Pete Carroll in the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Great uh, so when you get a bad outcome, they assume it, it, you, you just sort of work backwards at and say, okay, it must've been a bad decision. 
if you get a good outcome, work backwards from that. And it must have been a good decision. And of course, the problem with that is that it may not have been. I mean, I, I made, uh, you know, I, my book did very well. It doesn't actually mean it was a good decision to write the book. So, so as an example, I think that the framing of, I want to write this book for myself makes it a good decision, but let's say that I wrote the book because I said, I would, I want to make a best sell, write a bestseller so that I can be a famous author. Even if my book ends up being a bestseller and I end up being some sort of famous author that doesn't make that decision high quality. Right. So, so, but it's, it's very hard for us to actually disconnect those things in our heads. And that's one of the ways that we, um, that experiences can interfere with learning. The simplest example is, you know, the, the trope of like, I, I drive better when I'm drunk. <laughs> well, okay. You got home safely, but I'm pretty sure that was actually quite a poor decision. <laughs> So uh, you've you given the advice that uh, poker players should assess the quality of their play independent of actual outcomes, whether they win or right. lose the hand. Can you explain that advice and tell us how good decision makers could apply it to um, decisions outside of poker? Yeah. So first of all, let me just say easier said than done. I mean, these things are aspirational, um, but I do believe that uh, while you're never going to get there 100 percent, small gains create big results in the long run. So if you can improve the way that you're thinking about your outcomes and actually what the quality of the feedback is that you're creating for yourself, then, um, then it's actually going to compound over time. And you're, you know, that's, that's the way that you can actually get better results in your life. Um, but yeah, so essentially what, what we want to think about is if we know that the quality of the outcome in the short run is going to interfere with our ability to actually see the decision quality well. It would do us really well to try to figure out how can I actually get feedback on my actions that will allow me to get feedback that's truer to what ground truth is, what, what's actually true of the world, as opposed to being sort of overshadowed by the outcome. Now, just as an aside, one of the best ways to do that is to do some pre-work if you're actually in a regular decision-making environment, because then you can actually record the process prior to the outcome. I can't necessarily do that in poker, and there's a whole bunch of times where we're just sort of forced into these situations where we have to do a look back. So um, how would I do that? Well, uh, if I were uh, to think through the hand with you, I would try to put you in the state of knowledge that I was at the time that I was actually making the decision and not um, cause you to be interfered with by the actual outcome itself in a way that I might be. So an example would be, uh, and this is not naturally the way that people talk to each other. And, and this is why you have to do this with intention. Um, so let, let me just use the poker example. Um, I say to you, well, so I was in second position in the hand, the person in first position raised the pot. Uh, they were somebody who they played a lot of hands. I tell you some detail. I have to give you some things that I know about the person, right? They raised a lot of hands. They were very active. Um, when they came in, they were very aggressive. You know, I can tell, I can give you a profile, sort of the model that I've built of that person. Uh, and then I, I would tell you, okay, so I had ace queen and this is the way it normally goes. And I think that this should resonate with most people. Um, is I will say, so I had ace queen and I raised them back. What do you think of that? Well, the problem is I've told you what my opinion is already. Um, so the issue there is that I've already told you now what I did. And once I've told you what I did, you can't help but have that influence you. But this is kind of how we communicate with each other, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, so I was trying to decide about what to do in this trial and there was this particular witness and I wasn't sure whether I should call them or not. Uh, and here's the reasons why I was sort of thinking, well, maybe I should. And here's the reasons why I think maybe I shouldn't. But I decided to call them. What do you think? Like, this is just the natural way that we talk. So the better way to do it is tell you the model that I have of this opponent, tell you that they raised in front of me tell you how much they raise, give you some stats about the stacks and whatever you need to know, the information that I have. And I say, so I looked down at Ace Queen, what would you have done? Period. <laughs> Don't say anything else. Uh -huh. It's actually harder than you think. But yeah. now 
And notice I stop there and I can actually iterate through the whole hand that way. Right. And so at any point that you're giving me the information, you first of all, don't know what my choices were. And secondly, you don't know how the hand turned out. You don't know if I raised, did he raise me back, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's, and actually the way that people talk, it's actually a little worse than that. Cause they'll, act, mostly what people will do is they'll say, so then I raised and then, you know, they raised me back and then I called and then the, these came and then did, and I get you all the way to the end of the hand. And then I say, and then it turned out they had ace king and I lost the hand. So what do you think? Can you tell uh -huh. me how to play the hand? Right. So I try to divide it up into bits where I can shield you as much as possible from sort of the confounding, uh, you know, the way that the outcomes in my own opinions might confound your, your ability to see through that. And that's going to help me get better feedback. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you seen ways that you think resulting is impairing decision-making high stakes decisions in, in this pandemic where we see some outcome, uh, an outbreak here or uh, a nation that seems to have quelled its infection rate and we uh, jump to assuming that everything they did was either right or wrong? Yeah. Where do you see it affecting things? So I, I so everywhere. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, th there's a, there's a few, there's a few examples. So one thing is that we know that there's quite a bit of luck that has to do with um, certain super spreader events, like what, whether you catch them or not. So as an example, South Korea uh, initially had a pretty steep slope in comparison to the, some other, um, some other countries who were doing very similar things to what they were doing. It's just that they had a super spreader who infected like a thousand people or something before they caught up to them. And I think it, the issue was that they had tested them and they tested negative and then the person like went out and anyway, so that like, that's like a matter of just kind of like bad luck. Um, people point to Sweden quite a bit, but in isolation at the time as Sweden was the only one trying this strategy, uh, it's, it's a little bit, you need more data than that. Um, so I, I see it sort of across strategies for sure, but the place that, that I think that it's really problematic right now is that when you're dealing with uh, a virus that by its nature, because of the way that it grows, most of the actual valuable data is gonna be lagging what you're seeing today. Um, what happens is that people make decisions off of the state of the world this minute which is sort of the ultimate resulting and then try to decide whether the, the decision-making that led to this minute was good based on the, the state of the world today, the outcomes that we're seeing today. When of course, what you really care about is what are the quality of the decisions kind of independent of what we're seeing in this moment in terms of what we would sort of predict about what might be happening with the pandemic for a while. And I think that that's actually causing a lot of really bad decision-making because people are thinking that good decisions are being made because they're looking at the outcomes as they sit right then, as opposed to the process of what are the decisions that be, are being made in general in terms of what we know generally about the virus. So I think that one of the most astonishing examples of that is that sometime, I wanna say like the end of April or maybe in the middle of May or something like that, there were a bunch of people demanding apologies to Ron DeSantis, who is the governor of Florida. Um, because at the time, his outcomes were looking pretty good. Now, there were a lot of people arguing that his process wasn't good, which is what we should kind of care about, right? That as we think about uh, what type of virus is this, what information do we know about it, how does it spread, so on and so forth, that strategically and tactically, it did not feel like the decisions were particularly good for containing the virus. But at that time, the numbers were low. And so apologies were demanded. And then those policies got reinforced. This is the problem with resulting. And mm -hmm. it, those policies got doubled down on. And in fact, those policies got ramped up in terms of the speed uh, at, at which they were opening, the tolerance for indoor activities, and so on and so forth. It turns out in retrospect, Florida in April and May, it's pretty nice to be outside. Mm -hmm. You know, and in July, not so much. Mm -hmm. Like to go back into the air conditioning, um, and so there was there was some luck involved in terms of what was kind of happening at that time. But that's I think a really good example of resulting, and the way that resulting can really have real world consequences that become life or death. Because it wasn't even just that they decided the decision making was good based on the results at that time. They demanded apologies and then kind of doubled and tripled down 
on that as the, their their process for dealing with the virus. And I think you're seeing that in a variety of places. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Those political concerns uh, are reflected in a question from one of our viewers. Michael E. Hennon invites us to connect our respective interests oh, in good. decision quality and overconfidence. He asks uh, about the tension between overconfidence and decision making on the one hand, there are many circumstances in which it seems to be rewarded by voters, by venture capitalists and others. And at the same time, it poses all these risks for decision quality. And he wonders about that tension. Why do we reward overconfidence when it leads to bad outcomes? Well, I, I'll let you start because I've been holding the floor <laughs> quite a bit. So since, since this is your work also, um, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Oh, man, it's something that I've thought a lot about. Um, In fact, you wrote a book about it. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, I did. You did. Um, Perfectly confident. Everybody should go buy thanks, it. It's an excellent for that book. I have read it. <laughs> um, in, in Perfectly Confident, I um, don't get into the, the nitty gritty of this tension. It is, it is a thorny problem. In Perfectly Confident, I um, make the case for decision quality that um, you will be making better decisions if you believe the truth and if you avoid deluding yourself. But our questioner notes, there are circumstances in life when the world, other people reward us for expressing more confidence than we actually deserve. And we need look no farther than the White House to see that um, you can fool some of the people some of the time. And uh, I think that acknowledging that fact, so um, why does that happen? Well, as long as confidence, the, the confidence people express is correlated, however weakly, with their actual abilities or prospects or likelihood of success, well, then it might make sense to pay attention to that signal. Realizing that doing so rewards others for expressing more confidence than they ought to should make you second guess your willingness to attend to that signal and want to seek hard to fake signals. You wanna see a provable track record of accuracy. You want, instead of some vacuous claim about a glorious future, you want specific recommendations. Where do you think unemployment is gonna be in six months? How much money do you think your company is gonna make? And you wanna be able to confirm or disconfirm those claims when the data come in. So those are my thoughts off the top of my head. Yeah, so uh, so first of all, you know, plus one on all of that. Um, so, uh, so one of the things that I try to think about is, you know, I think that we always have these conflicts between our short-term goals and our long-term goals. Um, anybody who's ever been on a diet and was facing down a piece of birthday cake knows this, right? Boy, that birthday cake's awful good, <laughs> right? But, you know, obviously that's not necessarily good for your future self. And I, and I think that we have these problems all the time. Obviously there's a lot of really classic work that's been done on uh, intertemporal choice and uh, particularly the kinds of discounts that we're willing to take in order to get things now. Um, so I think that this kind of goes into that category that while in some ways, that while it's clear that if, if you were to say to somebody, do you think that if you're really well calibrated and that's how you're making decisions that you're gonna do better in the long run, uh, they'll say yes, but there's such a big reward for being kind of uncalibrated in the moment in terms of what you're expressing to other people who uh, may, uh, be more willing to like endorse you. And I obviously pun not intended, but I guess it's kind of a pun because if we're talking about politics, but whatever. Um, <laughs> so, so, but what I, what I try to do with people who are actually dealing with that conundrum, right. Which is I have to go sell people. I have to go recruit LPs. I have to actually get people LPs. to give me money, uh, like limited, limited partners, partners, right. Uh -huh. Right, I have, to, I have to go get investors to, to invest in me uh, and what I'm doing. So how can I do that and still uh, be well calibrated and express to them what are the things that I actually believe? Uh, and this is where I think that we can get into this confusion between sort of, sort of first order and second order, right? I can just say, we're gonna be great and it's gonna be amazing and I'm gonna make a gazillion dollars and my fund's gonna return 15X and, um, you know, we're all going to be rich, 
because uh, I'm amazing, right? <laughs> so that that would be one way to do it. And that can get rewarded. But I think that you can actually allow them both to live into the same space, which is um, we strive to see the world really accurately. Here are the ranges of outcomes that I think that we can have. Uh, here's the percentage of time that I think we're going to return this, the percentage of time I think we're going to return this. Here are the ways I'm going to be totally honest with you. Here are the ways that I think things go, can go wrong. Here are the ways that I think that things can go right. And I, this is our superpower. This is why we're better than other people and why you should give me your money as opposed to somebody else. Because we really understand that we need to really think accurately about this. We need to, we need to really live in the ways that we might fail in order to increase the probability of success. And unlike other people who are just sort of spouting this certain path towards success, we're thinking about this in a way where we can signpost uh, the problems that might occur. We, we already have plans in place. We're reducing the probability of those things occurring because we're actually thinking about the world in an accurate way. Now, how confident did I sound as I was saying that? Super confident because I was confident about my process as opposed to just promising the outcomes. And I have found that that's actually with the people that I work with, a really successful way to interact with people. And in some ways you're communicating something really important to them, which is you're communicating to them what they would endorse if you got them to be rational, right? If you were, if you stepped away from the situation and you said, who would you rather like, just the, hypothetically, like who would you rather invest in? Someone who's just like pie in the sky, P.T. Barnum, or someone who's really gone through the process and worked out the probabilities and is really thinking about their decision process and their investment process, uh, is really thoughtful, is thinking probabilistically, really trying to think about risk management and downside and upside, they would of course say the second person. So essentially what you're saying is, which tribe do you wanna be in? Do you want to be in the blowhard tribe or do you want to be in the really thoughtful tribe? <laughs> and you're, you're communicating that in the way that you're speaking to them. And, and you're still communicating lots of confidence because I am confident that when it comes to this type of way of thinking and executing on this type of process, that I'm going to be better than most people at it. I love that advice. And it makes me think of circumstances when entrepreneurs have been honest and well calibrated in communicating with others. Uh, there's the memorable uh, story of when Jeff Bezos told early Amazon investors, I think there's a 70% chance you're gonna lose all the money that you invest in Amazon. Right. So don't give me money unless you can afford to lose it. Right, which I think is totally fair. And the problem is that I think that the, the kind of first way of thinking leads to some stuff like I've, I've had people ask me before, uh, well, don't you think that if a college, if there's a college athlete who wants to end up in the pros, that they have to, they can't think about a plan B. They have to have plan A because if they have plan B, it's just going to make it so that they're not going to, they couldn't possibly be a pro. And I think that that, that type of thinking is very related. That very idea that you're contemplating failure is going to magically make it happen and then in the meantime, that whatever percentage of college, say basketball players who don't actually make it into the pros are just left with kind of no plan B, like this is acceptable for us, right? So like that's nutty. And, and, and what's, your, what's, your, what's your answer about the player who wants to make it into the pros? They should have a plan B because it, it's, it won't affect their, it literally will not affect their ability to make it into the pros. And in fact, it will probably increase the probability because if you're thinking in that way, if you're somebody who really thinks about plan B, one of the things that you're gonna think about is, let me think about my plan A and how might plan A go wrong? Uh, you could get injured. Okay, that, there's something you can actually do about that because there are certain things you can do in terms of uh, the way that you're training, what your training schedule is, how much you're seeing a, a PT person or whatever that can actually reduce the probability that you actually get injured. So, um, so by contemplating that road to failure, you can actually increase the, decrease the probability that that particularly, that you actually end up on that road and, and so on and so forth. I mean, you can, you can sort of go through and you can say, you know, what, what are other ways that I might fail? Um, in the off season, I could decide not to train and I could get really out of shape because I'm overconfident about my ability to get back in shape within a certain amount of time and I'm not calibrated 
well on how long that might take. So let mm -hmm. me give myself a really good cushion. I'm going to keep training during the off season, you know, so on and so forth. And so actually uh, the paradox is that the contemplation of failure increases success, even if our brains don't really accept that. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. I want to affirm your answer and also acknowledge, I know there are people in the audience who are skeptical. They're uh, they're sure that believing in themselves, fooling themselves into thinking that they're going to succeed is somehow helpful. And I just want to support what you said in describing a research result that resulted from a, a, a project where we went looking for the evidence where it, it, that would show that confidence contributes to performance. And we tested it in all sorts of different circumstances and failed again and again and again to find any such evidence. Oh my gosh, that's so amazing. Love it. I'll send you the paper. Um, the, it, it, that uh, gets us to a question about um, um, investing in uh, risky outcomes. So if you're just uh, sticking with highly probable outcomes, you're thinking probabilistically, um, wouldn't that leave uh, create the risk that you fail to discover uh, potentially rich uh, um, successes uh, by just focusing on the most likely outcomes or the most likely prospects. Yeah, so let me just clarify that when you're thinking probabilistically and that's how you're making your decisions, it doesn't mean you make a decision to choose the option that has the chance of success the most often. Uh, in fact, you may very well make a decision that where the chance of success is quite small. Um, but if the payoffs justify it, if, if what you're going to get in return justifies it, you would do it anyway, assuming that you can tolerate the downside risk. So let me put that into lots of English words as opposed to what I just said. Um, you can think about what do you have to lose? And if you can afford the loss, it's kind of the Jeff Bezos point, right? If you, if you can invest in me, if, you, if, if you're okay, if you never see this money again. Um, but some percentage of the time, mostly not, but sometimes you will win to this. And in that 30% that he was judging that those investors would make money, sometimes it's a little bit of money. And then a very small percentage of the time, it's a crazy amount of money. It's like so much money, you don't even know what to do with it, which is what ended up happening. Um, and there's going to be a lot of luck involved in that. There's going to be some skill involved in that. In terms of the real tail event, that becomes much more in the luck category than the, the skill category. But in, what that can mean is that depending on what you're trying to get out of the decision, it might actually be a much worse decision to invest in the thing that's the most probable. Because uh, the expectancy might actually be lower for you. It's just that you're de-risking, right? But if you're already in a situation where you can afford the risk, it, you know, it's going to be okay. So that's one, one thing to think about. The other thing to think about is that uh, one of the best ways to innovate is to kind of change your frame around the way that you think about your decisions. So, so uh, we tend to approach the world thinking that when we make choices, um, that that will be the only choice that we ever get to make again. Like I've got to spend a month researching whether I should take piano lessons because once I do that, I apparently could never stop. <laughs> but you could think, right, but you, you know, you have that feeling, right? Like where, where people get into this research mode and they're asking everybody, like, do you think I should, do you think I'd like piano? And trying to sort of get to some sort of certainty about whether, whether you would like it. That's actually the thing that stops you from having these sort of innovative and spectacular things happening because you're unwilling to engage in something until you're certain that it's going to be okay. You're certain that it's going to work out. And that's actually very counterproductive to good decision-making. Recognizing when you're in a situation where it's very easy to move off, off an option that you've chosen to revert either back to an option that you've rejected or maybe a brand new option that's come along your path is what actually allows for good decision-making because it allows you to make lots of little experimental choices. Right, so I'm not gonna think too hard about taking a piano lesson, I'll just go take one because that's gonna be the best information I can find in order to go find out if I like it. And you can do this in bigger ways and smaller ways. Uh, certainly in business, that's the idea between some, you know, now there's a movement in software development for agile software development, which is really just saying, let's release a lot of little features and we can pull those back 
if we need to. And what's really wonderful about that is that it allows you to implement this concept, which I call decision stacking, which is I can release a lot of small features that are easy for me to roll back and quit. And that's going to allow me to gain all this information about what do my consumers want? Like, what are my customers looking for? What kind of works? Uh, if I'm thinking about how I might code this, how, how, how do I do that? I can learn things about how long things take. And then when I have to roll out the really big change, I now have all of this information that's actually going to increase the probability of that big thing I want to do. And that might be a big thing that has, um, if I think about, and you can think about this as if it's a good thing to make decisions sometimes where the probability of success is low, but the payoff is quite high. If I've done this decision stacking and I've done all these kind of little pokes at the world with um uh, making smaller decisions that I can roll back, I've now become like this big information vacuum uh, in the good way, like a vacuum, like a vacuum cleaner. I've brought in all of this information that now may shift like the probability of success from like 1% to like 1.5%. And that's a humongous change when you're talking about huge payoffs. So it can actually increase the probability of those kinds of successes. Nice. That is uh, pure decision making gold. Thank you. Um, th this this has, this has been really fun, and there's so many other things I'd love to ask you about. Sadly, our time is at an end. Oh um, no, I'm so sad. I know it went by way too fast. I thought this was going till four. I thought we. Had <laughs> um, it, 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 not even not even till one Pacific time. Um, yeah. Uh, so thank you. Um, this, this is a delight, um, and, uh, a privilege. Um, so. Well, you for... too. And I just, I would like to reiterate to everybody again, like your book is amazing. Um, I think there's a, a few things, two things in particular that are really big ideas that don't get talked about very much. One is that overconfidence does not just come in one form. There are different ways that you can be overconfident or underconfident. Uh, and I think it's really important to think about what the difference between those things are and how they express. Uh, but the other one that I think is really, really so incredibly important is that everybody talks about overconfidence, but people don't talk about underconfidence. Uh-huh. And, yeah. and it's, it's a real problem. It's, it's a real problem because over allocation of resources is a problem, but under allocation of resources is also a huge problem. It costs a lot. It just in productivity, in earnings, in money, in your life's outcomes. It's humongous, and I just haven't seen very much said about it. And so that's why the per, you know, perfectly confident in terms of being calibrated around those two poles. I think it's just a really important idea, and people need to read your book. So I just would like to close with that: that people need to read your book. Um, you're very kind. I appreciate that plug. I think they need to read your book more. How to decide <laughs> coming out September. 15th, September 15th. Woo! And you're about to embark on the, on the um, w electronic world tour. I am, I, <laughs> you know, and also we talked a little bit about, I'm also the sort of icky promotion part, which <laughs> I hate all over my Twitter, but I will say, cause I actually think that this is a good thing for people to have. I am going to be on August 1st releasing an excerpt from the book, which is chapter seven, which is breaking free from analysis paralysis. It's a little bit what we just talked about, about how do you sort of make these speedy, more experimental decisions that can really mm -hmm. increase innovation, get out of analysis paralysis, which I think most people have experienced. Um, in order to get the excerpt, you have to sign up for my newsletter, which just, I hate saying, but if you go to <laughs> AnnieDuke.com and you sign up for the newsletter on August 1st, you will get that excerpt of chapter seven. So just because I think there's value in that for people, I will put out that little plug for people to go do that. Thank you. A worthy investment of your time, dear viewer. Check it out. <laughs> Annie Duke, thank you so much for spending this time with me. Those of you who are watching, thanks for tuning in. This was great fun. Bye. Thanks.